Hey, so we're starting a new series called Current, um, Godly Living in Today's World, where we're just going to kind of take a look at a couple of different uh, demographics, if you will, and we're going to stay consistent to the scriptures, but then we're going to, to take a look at, like, how does this get played out currently in our lives? And so today we're going to be focusing on men. Next week we're going to be focusing on women. Then we're going to go into children and then marriage. Um, so uh, these are going to be topics that are certainly uh, relevant and uh, important to all of us, even if you're not one, okay? So like, even if you're not a guy, you know guys, you might want to know guys in like a particularly romantic way. Maybe not. I'm just telling you, maybe not. You might be involved with, with a guy. You might have a dad or a son or whatever. So what we're going to do here is we're going to give God's um, call for men and it's going to be for everyone, because if you're a man, you're going to receive this directly. And if, and if you're a woman, what you're going to do is you're going to hear it, and you're going to be able to encourage those men around you. You're going to be able to know kind of who you're looking for and what would be God's best for you. Um, we're going to be in this together, and that, that holds true for, you know, when we talk about children or we talk about marriage. And uh, so we're going to bring it back to the Word, and we're going to say, hey, this is what God's Word has to say about it. And then this is kind of what it looks like in our current context, okay? And so we're going to do that uh, for the next couple of weeks, and I'm excited to be able to, uh, to do that with you. We're going to be kicking off a study in October called Beautiful Design, uh, where both the men and the women of the church are getting together on Wednesday nights, and we're going to be going through topics like this for about nine weeks at our church office over at the Trinity campus. So i uh, love for you guys to kind of mark your calendars and, and maybe uh, participate in that Wednesday night. And there's also, for the ladies, a, a Tuesday morning expression of that. So lots of good stuff we've got going on. So I'm going to hop in. I'm going to pray, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll go. Father, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would anoint us with the joy of what it means to know you, God, and that you would stir our affections for you in a way they've never been stirred before. We ask these bold things in the bold name of Jesus, saying thank you. Amen. All right, so um, we're gonna, gonna head, kind of hop right in here on, on the topic of men and getting current with men. So let's just, let's just begin with the premise that this is not gonna be a bash on men sermon, okay? I mean, how many of you ever heard like a bash on men sermon? You came and it was like, this is a great time. It's easy to like whip on the men and do something else with other people. So this is not that, okay? So if I start to, like, if I start to go in that direction, just be like, hey, remember, you start, I'm starting to feel the like whip here. It's not that. This is an encouragement. This is like a, hey, let's, let's do one thing and let's do it together. Uh, it's kind of what we, what we want to walk away from uh, with today. And, and so, but in order to do that, we got to talk about some, some things that are real. And so let's just start off with the struggle, if that's cool. The struggle is real, right? I mean, if, if you're a guy, and I know we can, we'll probably start here next week for the, for the ladies as well, but, but like the struggle is real. And, and I mean that in a couple of different ways. Um, there were just a couple of things that I kind of li listed off as I was preparing, preparing this um, in, in no particular order, but if, if we were to just talk about like being in relationship um, for a guy, the struggle is real to know when to say what and to know how to do this and to read the situation and, and even just to like maintain relationships. It's like we seem to sometimes be better at other things than relationships. And we move on from relationships, we go on, like we'll just hop right into one of the biggest struggles that, that our guys face today is pornography. Pornography is like a really big struggle. It's very rampant. I mean, you can throw out figures. It's always interesting when people throw out figures about pornography because it's like, well, if that's the figure, what about the, the rest of the crew that's not being honest? So you could take whatever number that, you know, you might have, statistics that have, and just like up it because it's, it's a thing. It's a real rampant thing that guys are struggling with on like a weekly and, and daily basis. And if it's not pornography, then it's mental health. It's mental health, depression, anxiety, addiction, whatever the case may be. Like these have landed squarely in our lives and they are defining actually quite a few of us. And, and so, you know, as, as we kind of think about some of these struggles and, 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 then, we, and then we start thinking about, okay, we're going to do a series on what it means to, to live godly as a man. Um, Man, it's important that we understand what God's word written so many years ago, what, what is that, what's that actually saying to me today in my current context? Like I get, I get it, but then maybe how do I do it? And, 
and, and what does it even look like? I mean, I think one of the things, as I talk to Jerry, he's, uh, he's our family life pastor, and um, even both Jerry and Liz, as they do relational harmony work, uh, one of the sentiments that they would have as it pertains to a lot of our guys in this particular church is that um, they, they want to do well, um, they want to live a godly life, they just haven't really seen it a lot. They didn't grow up with it. Um, they're not seeing it a ton around them now. And it's not necessarily for lack of desire, but when you don't have a model in front of you and you don't necessarily know where to look, it becomes almost impossible for you to begin to live a godly life in today's world um, when you feel like you're kind of on your own. And so that's where we want to kind of jump into um, this, this topic is, yes, the struggle is real, uh, we, we can affirm that, and we don't have to feel bad about the fact that the struggle is real. Jesus promised us that in this world you would have trouble, but take heart, he has overcome the world. So let's take a look about w- what it might look like for Jesus to overcome sort of our world and our, and our current struggles. And so let's, let's begin with a consistent view of manhood. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians. Um, and, and if you don't, the, the uh, scripture will, will be behind me. So if we can get that scripture up here, I'll kind of walk over to the screen and, and read it. So this is like, so there's a ton of scripture that we could kind of look at as it pertains to being a man. And so we're, we're going to we're going to take a, a broad view, and then we're going to take a look at a few examples that help us narrow down on what this stuff uh, really looks like in today's context. And so 1 Corinthians, this is a letter to uh, a church that had kind of, go- it was like a church gone bad, right? Like if you had a 12-year-old, you wouldn't let your 12-year-old see this church. You know, you'd wait till your 12-year-old was a little older because some of the stuff that was going down in this church was pretty raunchy. And so the apostle Paul, who was this guy who was a raunchy guy and had his life turned upside down, he's now, he's now trying to help all these churches, right? And, and he writes this letter to the church in a city called Corinth. And he's, a, he's addressing some different issues and he's getting close to the end. And he wants to leave them, specifically here, um, some, of the, some of the guys with a, with a push, with an encouragement. And this is how it reads. Uh, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all you do be done in love. Doesn't that sound like a man's verse? Like, I feel like I should grunt or something after I read that. It's like, yes, Absolutely but I have no idea how to do that. I mean, I think that's maybe a lot of our experience. It's like, I get it. That sounds like maybe there should be some sort of football coach in my face, like yelling that to me. But really, we have a loving and kind father inviting us to that, not twisting our face mask and forcing us. And so let's take a look at some of these, some of these imperatives here. Where, what we're called to do is be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, and be strong. Those are, we don't want to dice them up too much because they're actually kind of like pushing towards the same thing, right? And, um, and, and so one of the things that, the, that they're pushing at is, is kind of the, the end verse here is let all you do be done in love. It's like these things are good, and when done correctly, this is what it will look like, um, I was reading a, a commentary, which helps to kind of break down if you're, if you're kind of new to the whole Bible scene. So you've got your Bible, and, and when you read it, there's probably going to be a lot of parts that might be a little confusing to you, or it definitely were to me and can still be as I study it. And so um, I'll read uh, uh, commentaries or, or helps um, that you can get on the internet, or you can even get a Bible that's got notes at the bottom of it called a study Bible. And, and so one of the commentaries that I use is called Enduring Word by David Guzik. And, and in, in his commentary, what he, was, what he was helping me to understand was um, all of these be watchful, stand firm, you know, um, act like men, be strong, they're all actually military terms. They're all military terms, and they all kind of mean the same thing. And the be watchful is like, um, understand that, that there is an enemy. Like, this isn't just a freebie. You don't just become a godly man without struggle, without pain, without loss. Like, there's, there's enemies that would um, prefer you not to mature as a godly man. Uh, there is uh, a spiritual enemy which we call Satan. Scripture talks a lot about Satan. There's, a, there's an inside enemy, which we just call the flesh, where we just, you were like Peter Pan's, you know? Like, we just don't want to grow up. 
Just love the life we had when we were 12 and mama made everything. And, and there's all sorts of, just all, the world tells us all these things. So we've got, and so like, all right, understand, you need to head into this as more of a soldier. Like there's gonna be a struggle. So if the struggle's real, well, welcome to manhood. Stand firm in the faith. And this was an aspect that had us standing together. In, 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 the, in the Greek, it was more of like, um, when you stand firm in the faith, it's like don't break ranks. Don't try to go over here on your own because you'll get wiped out and then the team will not be as strong as it was when you were with them. Have you ever seen that scene in um, Gladiator where they all kind of get back to back and like their javelins and spears are pointing out and there's not a ton of them, but because they've organized themselves together in a soldier-like way, they can, they can take on this incredible enemy. If one of those dudes jets, for whatever reason, the whole thing falls apart. Similar imagery here. Act like a man. Beast, we're going to talk about that. Like, okay, so what does that mean? I'm giving you some things here that kind of help us to understand it, but we're going to look at some examples actually in the negative that I think bring us even closer to it. Be strong. Okay, when, when they were talking about act like a man, be strong, especially the, the man part, it was like um, don't flinch. Don't flinch. When it, when it comes upon you, because you're watchful, because you're standing together, like be prepared for it. And when, it, and when it comes, when the temptation comes, when the desire to live, you know, ungodly comes, when the, when the desire to uh, lean into some of those things that I began the message with comes, don't be surprised by it. Don't flinch because it's coming. Like stand your ground and be strong. It's okay to suffer for a desire greater than the one that's just immediately in front of you. It's okay to suffer for a desire besides the one that's just immediately in front of you. It's okay to bleed for that. Don't flinch, don't go anywhere. If you're bleeding and if you're sweating and if you're in pain because of something greater than just your next desire, then welcome to godly manhood. We've been waiting for you. Let all you do be done in love. Okay, so, so okay, you can do all this, but if it's not done in love, if it doesn't produce a life that is radically loving, then it's all in vain. You're just tough and annoying and a bully and nobody really likes you, but they haven't told you yet. You might have scripture on your arm. You might be able to recite it, but if it hasn't penetrated your heart and you're not known as this radically loving, generous, kind man, you've missed it. It's not working. Now, where would Paul get his definition of love? I was meditating on that this morning, talking with, talking with the Lord about this this morning. And, and so Paul was captured by one love, okay? You guys have to know this or you won't understand his writing. He was captured by the love of his heavenly father. And here's how the love of his heavenly father looks. So, so in, in the scriptures, you have God the Father, and then God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit. And so Paul was, he was just so captured by this idea that, that God the Father loved him at his worst. So Paul was like murdering Christians. He was, get, he was rounding them up. He was persecuting them. And, and, and Paul believed that God the Father, even though Paul, who used to be called Saul, was like doing all this horrific stuff, he believed that God the Father loved him even in that moment to the point where he would send God the Son to go to a cross in Paul's place. And so Paul understood justice. He understood that like when you do wrong, you pay the crime. He got that. And what he believed was that because this God is perfect and holy and just, he should have crushed himself, Paul, for all the stuff that he had done. But because he loved Paul to the degree that he loved him, he chose to crush his son, Jesus, in his place. It was this radical love that God the Father had for Paul when he was at his worst that caused him to give his best, namely Jesus, to die in Paul's place, to die in your place, to die in my place when we were at our worst, knowing us fully. Paul believed that that love was not simply a martyr's love, that um, there's a statue to Jesus today that we go and applaud and, and then go along with our lives. He believed that it was the love of a savior, 
that it was a love so great that not only did Jesus die for our sin and his sin, but that he rose from the dead and he overcame our sin. He overcame our death. He overcame the penalty that had our name on it. And he gave us the opportunity to respond to that love as Paul did. And here's how Paul responded to that love. When he heard about that love, which you've just heard right now, that's the gospel truth, that Christ died for you. He didn't just leave it alone. He knew that that was the kind of love that demanded a response. When somebody comes and, and you're in front of the car that has like lost control and is heading for you and they push you out of the way in order that they would get crushed, you don't walk away from that scene. You respond to that love. Like what kind of radical love? You don't even know me. As a matter of fact, I just robbed and stole from you. And that's how you responded. You respond to that type of love. That's what Paul did. And the way that we respond to the love of the Father is we just kind of, we say, look, man, I get it. I'm, I don't work the way I'm supposed to. I, you're holy. I'm not. I totally get that. But you love me anyways. Like, you're saying yes to me anyways. I'm saying yes to you. I believe that you did that for me. And I believe that the life you have for me is better than mine. I give you my life. I want to follow you by faith. That's what that kind of radical love does. It doesn't leave us unchanged. And, and for Paul, he, he was writing with, with that at the center of his heart. He's like, so men, here's what it looks like. That you would live such a life that was so radically dedicated to the Father that when those around you were at their medium, their best, or especially their worst, you would continue to give your best over and over and over again, regardless of the response. Regardless of what you're receiving from it, you've already committed in your mind and in your heart and with your hands that you are going to give the best of yourself so that others can flourish no matter what you receive in return. That's the picture of godly men. They are self-sacrificing men so that others around them can flourish. The question is, where do we look for, for somebody like that? Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of bad examples, do we not? We've titled it, Men Gone Bad. All right, you ready? You wanna see a couple of men gone bad? I mean, I don't have them here. I'm not going to pray them out. This is not the opposite of giving honor where honor is due. This is, we're not, this is we're not shaming anybody. We're just going to talk about a few, um, a few of my friends. I call them my friends because they're in the scriptures and I learn a ton from their life. Um, so let's take a look at a few of my friends. If we could see the next slide, we're going to see um, a couple of names here that help us to see kind of what we don't want to do and, and be. This would be a time if you want to Kind of follow along, fill it out, cool. If not, that's cool too. All right, first one, Adam. So Adam, if you don't know who Adam is, uh, the Bible talks about Adam as the first created being. We believe that he's the, the, the first human and, and he had responsibilities to lead and create and, and to um, make sure that everything around him, both, both um, Eve and creation, it flourished because of what he initiated and kept going. And that's like what it means to be created in God's image. Things flourish when you're there. That's just a great question to think about right now. Family, your daughter, your parents, your people in the church group, the people that you coach on your little league team, are they flourishing like when you're around? And this isn't prideful. I'm not saying because you're great. I'm saying because, because you bring something that would be missing if you weren't there. It's a great question. So Adam had that same responsibility, and, and, and here's what happened to Adam. Um, if, if you're familiar with the story, uh, they were, they, both he and Eve were, were tempted uh, by the enemy, by Satan, but actually Satan speaks to Eve, and, um, and they end up eating, Eve first and then Adam. And, and uh, what happens is God comes, and he's, he's got, like, more responsibility. He has more sort of weight directed toward Adam than Eve, because it was Adam's responsibility to set the spiritual climate. It was Adam's responsibility to lead. And what we see in this particular passage is that Adam had this apathy that led to passivity. An apathy that led to passivity. Now, it doesn't say that anywhere in the scriptures that Adam was apathetic. But what we're doing here is we're, we're taking a look at his example, and, and what Adam did was he stood by and watched as the world fell apart. 
He had a front row seat as everything was falling apart. It's hard to do that when you're passionate about what you're looking at. When you're passionate about what is in front of you and it starts to fall apart, what do you do? Something, anything, you get involved. You don't freeze up from inactivity. When your heart is passionate about something or someone and you see that someone or something going bad, man, you don't become passive, you become active, you engage. But unfortunately, what we see with Adam here is he, he had apathy that led to passivity, where he simply just stood by and he was there, but he was watching. Just a question, right? Like, let's just remember, we're not gonna, nobody's getting hurt today, right? Let's do, let's do a question. Does this describe, guys, does this describe your home life at all? Like you're there, but you're watching. You're watching mom do this and discipline and read the Bible story and pray and set this and do that and that. Hey, it's awesome that we share that responsibility. It's awesome that we can do that together. But I know that sometimes we, we unfortunately move ourselves into this thing where because apathy sometimes sets into our heart, it's just kind of easier to watch and stay out of the way than it is to be an initiator that brings new things to life. David, idolatry. Oh, first of all, let me tell you who David was. So these are, these are kind of biblical names. I'll just give you a brief, brief sort of intro to each of them. David was this king by the point where we're going to talk about, and he had done a ton of awesome things. David loved God, right? He loved God, and so he wasn't apathetic. David's problem was not apathy. It was idolatry. It was that other things were starting to creep into his life that he loved potentially more or at the same level as God. So David wasn't a sit-on-your-hands type guy. He wasn't a guy that lacked passion. He had a ton of passion, but just sometimes it was misdirected. So David's been doing a ton of good things, right? He's been winning battles and, and the land's being conquered and the name of the Lord is going out. And so what, what David decides to do is he decides to sit one out. And he decides that I'm going to stay home when really I know I should be over here. I'm going to give myself some permission to stay home and sit this one out because there was this growing love in David's heart for comfort and convenience that seemed to be like at least matching his love for the person of God. Now, again, it doesn't say that. You're not going to see, and thus David began to serve the idol of comfort. But what we're doing here is we're, we're looking at the scripture and we're saying, hey, if this, then that. And so with David, we see that his idolatry, he wasn't bowing down to a false god in the sense of like something that was carved or some image or something like that. It's that his heart was starting to, to, to grow um, more and more attracted to the comforts of this world, and it actually put him in the wrong place. In, in David's case, he ended up committing adultery and murder from it in order to cover up his adultery. And so we see that David here is a person where idolatry um, led to permission. It led to permission. David began to give himself permission to do things that he would have never done before because of the idolatry that was growing in his heart. Judas. Judas. Um, if you know Judas, Judas is the one notoriously for, for betraying Jesus and, and selling him out with a kiss. He's like, there he is. And he was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And, and then he turns on him when things get bad. And, but you can kind of see that Judas had this thing going on all the, all the while where um, he was known to like dip into the money bag. And he wasn't always, it didn't seem like he was always down with the way that Jesus rolled things out. And um, Judas, you know, there's a lot that we can talk about Judas and kind of wh why he ended up in the place he ended up. But, but I think one of the things that drove Judas was religion. Religion. Now, if you're new here, you might be like, I thought this was a religious institution. Why are, why are you saying religion is, is a bad thing? The, the way I'm using the word religion is when you begin to think that if you work harder, then God owes you. Religion is when you do and then God responds to you. And so um, Judas had that going on in his heart, it seems like. It was like, man, like, I'm doing this stuff. I've been following you for three years. Like, um, 
I don't like, you're starting to talk about you're going to die and we're not going to get sort of the power that Judas probably thought a Messiah, a king would bring in. And so what Judas was suffering from was religion that ended up leading to pride, to pride. So as we, as we kind of look at some of these things we've, we, we've got here, um, we, we've got apathy that leads to passivity where we're just kind of hands off. We've got some idolatry that's going to lead to permission. Now, th- by the way, <laughs> I could find some female names that go here as well. Th- these are not, like, guys, we don't just own these. <laughs> we, we share these well. But today we're, we're, we're focusing in here, on, and then Judas had some pride issues here. And, you know, th- so the question kind of becomes like, all right, so what's the answer to this? Like, where do we go for, for something better? And I, and I think that we've got to start with NFL Sunday. All right, so I don't know if you thought I was going to go there or not. But I, I feel like, man, that's a great place for us to start is NFL Sunday. Some of you are like, dude, you just, trans- you just went from Judas to NFL Sunday. What is wrong with you? That's a whole nother sermon. So anyways, NFL Sunday is, is really big, man. Like, like, I feel as though it might just give us the answer to our question. Now, now here's what I did, right? So I brought, I asked, some, I asked some, some ladies, I'm like, hey, I was at church, I need a football. So I, I asked three different ladies and I got a couple of different footballs, okay? So I got this one football, which, which I think is gonna be super helpful to us. I've got this football, which can knock you out if you miss it, okay? So I need you to have like good hands if I throw it to you. And um, okay, I've got this football, which is old school. It's been used before, okay? So when you touch it, you're gonna know that you're touching many games of of football. And then I've got this one where it's like, I'm not sure, but will a rugby ball do? (laughs) So, you know, I'm like, we're talking about men. So you wanna talk about a manly sport? There you go, there you go. All right, so we've got all these. Let me just start here with this one. And, And, Let's, let's process here together just a little bit. Now, if you missed this one, it's okay. It's okay. It's not going to hurt too bad. Okay, but I'm going to just try to get it throwing to, to people who look like they're ready for it. Who's, okay, ready? Oh, money, right there. Right there. Just like the dolphins in first place still. I love that. All right, I'm going to take it back. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so listen, what does NFL Sunday have to do? He was wide open. That was awesome. What does NFL Sunday have to do with this idea that, I'm going to go deep here. Oh, yeah, I see you. I see you over there. Look at that. Listen, I don't want to get prideful. I hit that dude in the hands from way over here. Can you think you can get it back to me? You can. You stand. Yep. Oh, man. Oh, man. He just won up to me. Enough with this example. I got to throw to somebody else. Here's the deal, right? Here's the deal. NFL Sunday, I heard it's kickoff today, so my brother-in-law told me, you can't go late, Giants are on at one. I totally respect that, Paul Carley, I do. As you watch football today, or yesterday, or whenever the case may be, here's what I want you to be thinking. In order to excel on the football field, you have to have a greater affection for your comfort and your convenience. In order to excel on the football field, you have to have something that means more to you than just getting hurt or being safe. You have to have this affection for this greater goal where you're actually willing to take hits that will cripple you for the rest of your life. In order for you to excel at this particular sport, you have to be very committed to a desire greater than your comfort and your convenience. You have to be willing to be crushed in order for you to get something greater than just simply what's in front of you. It's like you have to have a bigger and better affection than just yourself. The answer to these issues that we put up here earlier is stirred affections. Stirred affections. You're going to see this in the NFL today. You're going to see... That these guys have 
stirred their affections to the point where they're willing to go across the middle, raise their arms, and get crushed in here in order to gain eight yards because they believe that raising the Lombardi trophy is greater than them walking normally when they're 44. That's true. They have a greater affection than simply the comfort and convenience of being safe. When it comes to the things that we just talked about, passivity, being permissive, being prideful, those are things that you can't work yourself out of. As it pertains to being passive, you don't fix that by getting more active. You don't fix that by simply doing more things. As it, as it pertains to giving yourself permission, you don't fix that by a greater accountability plan, by trying harder. You don't fix that by your own strength. Maybe for a while, but it doesn't last. When it comes to those of us who struggle with pride, we don't fix that because we are the problem. We need something greater. Thomas Chalmers talks about it as an explosive power of a new affection, that there has to be something that we want that's greater than simply the pornography that we're watching for the immediate result. We call that sort of a, a result of diminishing effects. Fill in the blank. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's pornography or whether it's working too late or whether it's drinking too much. When, when all we have is a plan to try harder, it won't work. The heart is not changed by you trying harder. The heart is changed when it falls in love with something greater than the thing you currently are owned by. So stirring your affections is the answer. Is an accountability plan important? Yes. Are some of those other things that I mentioned important? And, and do they support the stirred affections? Yes. But if all you do is plan to work and try harder, you will most likely end up in the same cul-de-sac that you've always been in, or you might somehow get out and just be super prideful. Stirred affections. So what happens when, when a person becomes stirred with their affections? So here's the deal, like our world is full of people who are, are prideful and permissive and, and passive as, as far as guys go. What happens when you begin to stir your affections is, is we start to see guys who are consumed with initiation. They begin new things, like their life is, is marked by new things rising up around them. We begin to see guys who are marked by freedom. Not only their own freedom, but the freedom of others around them. They help lead other people to freedom. We begin to see guys who are marked by, by worship. Like their lives are filled with worship. I, lo I long for the day when I'm gone. And if my children have three words to talk about their daddy, this is how I want them to talk about their daddy. He was a man who initiated things. Like man, he initiated things. They weren't all good, but he didn't watch life go by, man. He initiated new things. He gave his life so that new life could come up around him. I want my kids to talk about me as, this is a dude that walked in freedom. Now, you know me, and you know I struggle here. You know I struggle with anxiety, and you know it holds me down, and, and it owns me sometimes, and I hate it. But it doesn't own me like it did six weeks ago, and it doesn't own me like it did six months ago or six years ago. So even though my freedom is not complete, my freedom is being gained more and more and more. And I want my kids to know this is a man who struggled, but he tasted freedom that reminded us of the freedom we'll all taste in Christ one day. And I want him, I want him to talk about me being a worshiper. This is a dude that worshiped all the time. He actually sometimes embarrassed us by the way he worshiped. I don't want to be known as worshiping the Red Sox more than Jesus. I don't want to go out like that. So here's what I do. Here's what we do. It's getting to be playoff time. And we actually are big Red Sox fans. And so you know what we do? 
You know what we do is we, um, we know that there's, there's going to be a cost to following the Red Sox because sometimes they might play West Coast. Sometimes their games might be late. Sometimes, like, for us to follow them in the playoffs, man, because they're going to go deep this year, like, so, so for, it's going to be hard. We're going to have to pay the price. So you know what we do before playoff season or sometimes before the real season starts is we'll watch four nights in October. It's a 30 for 30 that documents back in um, 2004 the greatest athletic endeavor ever. When the Red Sox, you can disagree, but you're wrong. When the Red Sox came back in the pennant, they were down 0-3. No team in MLB history has ever done this. They came back. They defeated some team from New York. I can't forget what, I don't know, Giants. I think it was Mets. No, no, it was the other one. Anyways, um, I've got Yankee fans here, so, and I'm related to one, so I'm going to be careful. They can't, listen, here's what we do. We watch it. And, and we st- our affections are sweet. Listen, we know what's going to happen. It happens every time we watch it. There's rarely a time we watch it where I, where I, I don't have, like, some moisture in my eye. I'm not, I'm not lying. But our affections are stirred, and then it's like, postseason, baby, what's up? Let's rearrange our lives around this for a while. So I just think that, like, Jesus is inviting you to do the same thing with him. Like, I, that's not bad. I'm, I'm not condemning us or Dolphin fans or whatever because we're, like, into something here. Let's just think about that and say, well, how does that apply to the thing that's actually going to last forever? How do I stir my affections for Jesus the way I stir them for my athletics or my job or whatever? So this is where we'll end. I just want to get, like, really practical with you guys because... I'm, I'm, I would imagine that if, if I were to get current with you right now, you're probably, you're probably one of these things. Can we go to the get current slide? You're probably one of these things. Yep, keep going. Oh, that was too far. I think there's a slide that's, yeah, that's the one. You can probably relate to one of these things. Maybe you're apathetic and passive. Like, that's kind of a thing for you. Maybe you're idolatrous and permissive. That's me. I give myself permission to go in old habit loops of my anxiousness all the time because I'm looking for security that only Jesus can bring me. And I trade my idol. I love Jesus, but I love security. And, and so I, I go back and forth, and, that, and that's what catches me up in my anxiety, and, and I'm just a prisoner to that sometimes. I give myself permission to go back. Less and less, but that's me. I don't know who you are, but, but you're maybe one of these. Maybe you're religious and prideful. I don't know. They, they, they kind of work together. And so the question is, practically speaking, the answer is, like, let's stir our affections, Let's begin to act like one man. There's a, there's a ton of guys you could say, well, let, let's look at this guy, let's look at that guy. Let's look at just one man here before we leave. Let's look at Jesus. And if there's one thing that Jesus did, there's usually a point in the messages where I'm like, if I say this, I'm not sure this is going to come out right. I said that last week. This is the part where I'm not sure it's going to come out right, but I think it might just be the most important thing I, I need to say. If there's one thing that you can see that Jesus did, obviously outside of the cross and his resurrection and like winning, like salvation for humanity, healing, feeding, like what what is it that we want to focus on? If I could send you away with one thing, I would say this. Jesus took leadership over stirring his affections for his father. Jesus took leadership over stirring his affections for his father. He didn't wait for somebody to say, hey, Jesus, I think you should go away now and spend some time with your father. He didn't say, hey, hey, Jesus, I think you should go back and read the Old Testament, be reminded of your father's goodness. Nobody was saying, hey, Jesus, now's the time where you need to stop all this business and all this good work in order to kind of stir your affections for the father. Jesus was crazy allegiant to his father because that was his great love. You will follow your great love. If your great love is not Jesus, you will follow something else. It's your responsibility, men, to do one thing. Stir your affections for the Father. Stir, don't get better, don't get cleaner. Stir your affections for your Father. If you wanna quit being passive and permissive and prideful, stir your affections for your Father. John Ortberg writes a book called God is Closer Than You Think. I'd just like to encourage you in in some of the pathways that he writes about this week because we all don't stir our affections the same way. 
Some of us go down an intellectual pathway where we draw closer to God the more we know about him. Some of us go down a relational pathway where we actually experience God the more we're in relationships and we're giving ourselves to people. Some of us go down the serving pathway where as we serve, we're experiencing God and his goodness and his closeness. Some of us go down the worship pathway where we just throw on some worship, whether it's old school or new, whatever, and it's like, man, we're meeting God in that moment. Some of us go down the activist pathway where when we step into a cause like FPNO, it's like we come to life and so does God because we're made in his image and God is the greatest activist out there. Some of us come to life with God in the, compl- in the contemplative way. This pathway is where like distractions and things are lowered and we're, we can focus and hear the voice of the Lord. And some of us come in the creation pathway where as we're out in God's beautiful creation, we're experiencing him. Now listen, none of this replaces being in the scripture where, where this is God's, it's his, it's his love letter to us. And, and so here's what I want to do. This is where I want to end. I love how Dallas Willard says it. You have this quote at the bottom of your outline. It says this, arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. Take some leadership. Take some leadership this week, guys. This is an invitation. This is not a, this is, you're not being school. This is an invitation. Take some leadership over stirring your affection for God. Read one psalm a day. Just read one psalm a day this week. Do it with a pen or pencil so that you can highlight things that God highlights in your heart. And think about how you connect with God best. And then go make an appointment to do it. Set aside time to do it. It is the most manly thing you can do. Wake up early, read your Bible, and go spend some time with your father. It's the best thing you can do for anyone around you, including yourself. We're going to stand for prayer and be dismissed. And we're going to have prayer partners up front here if you want to ask for prayer and have people um, just ask God's blessing over you, ask God's help in this journey for you. We want to be here and walk alongside you in this journey as well. You'll hear some music behind me that's kind of for you to, if you want to stay and sing cool, we're actually officially dismissed. So all the parents, we'd ask you to go get your children. But prayer will be open as well and maybe this is a moment where you need to have your affections stirred so let's ask God to do that Father thank you so much for being with us and for being the one who meets us in this effort and this energy your grace is received as a gift but it's not against like putting energy into a life where we get to know you more and so Father I pray for the men that you would give us stirred affection this week, that we would take leadership over our stirring of affections for you. I pray for everyone else here that, that, that you would help them to encourage us in that process. Lord, we love you, and we look forward to meeting you in your word this week and in the unique way you've designed us. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed. Love you guys. Circle